Hello everyone and welcome back to Lady Disdain Reads. Today I bring to you another in-depth single novel discussion, this time on Jane Austen's Emma. Some of the issues I will be discussing today I have already touched on in other videos, uh, for example in my first video where I discuss philosopher Alistair McIntyre's interpretation of Austen as an ethicist, as well as in my most recent videos where I review Sarah M. Seuss' book on Austen, Virtue and Philosophy. Both videos will be linked down below for you to check out and take a look at. So, let's talk about Emma. Emma is considered to be um, Austen's most accomplished work from a technical and literary point of view by many critics. Um, and yet it is a novel where the heroine undergoes the greatest moral transformation, so it's interesting from that point of view too. I really think it's a testament to Jane Austen's skills that so many readers will name Emma as their favourite of her works, when I think Emma herself, the character, for most of the book is someone we could only really describe as a terrible person. <laughs> now, what do I mean when I say a terrible person? What vices is Emma guilty of? Um, what's the main vice that she's guilty of, really? And what are the virtues that she learns throughout the novel? Well, firstly, she is guilty of pride and vanity. We are told at the beginning of the book by the narrator that Emma has a disposition to think a little too well of herself. This is a great example of a Stinian understatement, as Emma's pride does not consist in simply thinking a little too well of herself. She thinks she is actually the sole authority to be trusted on most matters, maybe with the exception of this Mr Knightley. And she is convinced that she is more intelligent, wiser, more trustworthy and better equipped overall to make decisions than really anyone else in Highbury. Emma is also vain. But how is she vain? Well, we know that Mr Knightley tells Mrs Weston, I do not think her, meaning Emma, personally vain. Considering how very handsome she is, she appears to be little occupied with it. Her vanity lies another way. What he means when he says she is not personally vain is that she is not so much concerned with her appearance as what, what other think of her appearance. She is not concerned with uh, her beauty being appreciated by others, that is. What she is concerned with is people thinking that she is good at being in charge. That's where her vanity lies. A perfect example of this is Emma's unlikely friendship with Harriet Smith. Emma enjoys this sense of authority over Harriet. She enjoys feeling superior to her and moulding her according to her own ideas of what a respectable, respectable young woman should be and do. And this brings me to a point um, Sarah Emsley makes, actually, which I discussed in my most recent video. That is that Emma's desire for power over others is a sort of unregulated and misapplied version of the virtue of charity. If charity, as Emsley suggests, is the one virtue that Emma must and indeed does learn to practice by the end of the novel, then throughout the novel we can see that she is guilty of practicing an excess of it, um, that is, she is guilty of the vice of condescension. So what do I mean by condescension? Well, let's think about um, how she behaves towards both Harriet Smith and Miss Bates. Um, Mr Knightley, for example, is disappointed in Emma when she misapplies her talents and offends Miss Bates by being condescending towards her um, at, at Box Hill at the picnic. And after Emma ridicules Miss Bates in front of everyone else that they know, in front of all of their acquaintances at Box Hill, Mr Knightley reprimands Emma by saying this. It was badly done indeed. You, whom she had known from an infant, whom she had seen grow up from a period when her notice was an honour, to have you now, in thoughtless spirits and the pride of the moment, laugh at her, humble her, and before her niece too, and before others, many of whom would be entirely guided by your treatment of her. So we can see really here what Mr Knightley thinks that Emma has done wrong. First of all, she is prideful. We've talked about this already. Secondly, she is shaming and ridiculing someone who is maybe not her social equal, but um, in terms of status, Miss Bates, we know, is not as high up in society as Emma herself, 
but she is someone who is a superior to her in age and experience and therefore deserves her respect. And that is exactly what um, Emma is not granting her, her respect. She's being guilty of condescension because she thinks that she is capable of judging Miss Bates better than anyone else there. It is also here important to note that the one character Emma could be said to personally dislike the most, the formidable Mrs. Elton, is in some ways, the, in some ways at least, not in all ways of course, but in, in the respect of um, condescension, of being condescending, she is actually the character Emma most resembles, isn't she? Um, she's the one that she most resembles in her tendency to be condescending and prideful towards others, because just as Emma is condescending towards Miss Bates, um, Mrs. Elton is condescending towards Jane Fairfax. She has the same superiority towards Jane Fairfax that Emma also feels towards Harriet Smith. Both characters think they can mould other young women into fitting their view of what they should be like. Also, just as Emma wants to be in charge of social occasions at Highbury, so Mrs. Elton wants to take over gatherings, such as the strawberry picking at Donwell Abbey. Now, I want to bring in another critic here um, to make a really interesting point about this. In his essay on Austen, called Regulated Hatred, literary critic and professor of psychology D.W. Harding argued that Emma, the novel, <laughs> consists in Emma the character's gradual, humbling self-enlightening, and that Emma's personality includes some of the tendencies and qualities that Jane Austen most disliked. Self-complacency, for instance, and a weakness for meddling into other people's lives. Well, <laughs> I think it's safe to say that I agree, agree with um, D. W. Harding here. Um, some of these qualities that Emma exhibits, he also uh, mentions malicious enjoyment of prying into private affairs and snobbery. All these qualities um, are not only to be found in Mrs. Elton, who's clearly not the heroine of the novel, but they're to be found in Emma herself. And this is quite unusual for Jane Austen. All of her characters have faults, of course, but not all of them have so many faults all at once. And um, there, I can't think of another Austen heroine in the six major novels, at least, who has so much to learn as Emma does. But <laughs> if D.W. Harding is right, and I think he is in saying this, then why write a novel where the heroine is such a terrible person? Well, I personally see Emma as an exercise in a writer's ability to lead readers to like an unlikable purpose, person, sorry, to like an unlikable person with the purpose of eventually making them realise how ridiculous it was to like someone like Emma, or at least the Emma that um, we find at the beginning of the novel. So rather than directly moralising at us, which she definitely doesn't do, Austen's more subtle narrative presence, her choice to identify um, the narrative voice with Emma's um, perspective to the extent that they often become blurred, in fact, makes us readers share in Emma's prejudices, snobbery and condescension. The word blunder, repeated over a dozen times in the novel, perfectly describes what we as readers experience before realising that we too may have been just as condescending towards Miss Bates and Harriet Smith as Emma herself. And of course, the point of such an unlikable heroine is that if we share her perspective in the lack of proper charity towards others, so too we learn with her when she repents. The moment when the full effect of her incivility towards Miss Bates is made clear to her by Mr Knightley is her moment of repentance, or the moment of what C.S. Lewis, as I explained in a previous video, um, which is also linked below, would term her moment of undeception. We're told by the narrator that she now acknowledges her own insufferable vanity and that she feels anger against herself, mortification and deep concern. Never had she felt so agitated, mortified, grieved at any circumstance in her life. As Emma can finally see the blunders and the blindness of her own head and heart, as the narrator tells us, so we, the readers, can also see the blunders we commit, both in our reading of the novel and in our own lives. 
And I think that's really where the moral dimension of Austen's project for Emma comes to light. We realise that we have been made by, by Austen to share in Emma's snobbery, in her prejudices, and just as she repents, we repent with her. Um, we repent for having liked her so much in spite of her being a terrible person and for having maybe approved of her at the beginning of the novel. And we also repent of maybe sharing in her view of some of these characters that she is condescending towards. And of course, that's also the difference in the end between Emma and Mrs. Elton. Um, within the course of the novel, Mrs. Elton doesn't learn, um, but Emma does. And so too are we meant to learn from her. So today was a bit of a shorter video. I hope you enjoyed it. I will bring another longer video uh, in a couple of weeks time. And for now, keep checking this channel um, for new content before moving on to Persuasion, which is Austen's last um, f full published book, her last completed novel that was published. I will hopefully make a video on Austen's Anglicanism using a couple of books that I've been reading uh, about, about Austen and her faith. So keep tuned for that. And if you have any video requests, um, please also make sure to write them down in the comments below. Thank you and see you next time. Bye.